thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Is the mic loud enough? Okay. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. And, um, you know, I'm so excited to be talking about this today because this truly is, when we talk about root causes in our healthcare system, this is one of the root causes that we need to fix within our healthcare system to, you know, to fix, you know, some of the symptoms we're seeing of higher healthcare costs you know, more chronic diseases, higher use of medications. This is getting at the root of it because our children are the future. You know, they're the future generation. And so, you know, we talk about, you know, the burden, the financial burden of baby boomers, but when you look at the cost of kids entering our healthcare system, you know, under the age of 10, and there's a lifetime of care that's needed to support these kids, that's an incredible cost and an incredible burden. And you know, what I'm so encouraged with in working with kids is, you know, compared to working with adults, kids are a bit of an easier fix. And so I'm a little bit biased to my, my pediatric patients because working with their diet, working with supplementation, working with lifestyle changes, you can see very quick results and very quick changes in them, you know, just changing small things. And so some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today hopefully will spark some ideas, spark some conversation, you know, that we can continue. Um, but, but what I'd like to present to you today is, is from our experience here at the Reardon Clinic, what we feel is needed to help develop a generation of optimal kids. So, um, you know, I liked it with, with a lecture, kind of give the why, you know, the why behind, you know, why am I so passionate about this? And for me, it started um, with these two. These, this, this is my, my son and my daughter. They're, my daughter's Evie is six, and Brody is just about to turn four. And um, for me, the birth of my daughter sparked a journey, you know, searching for answers. You know, what sort of, you know, pregnancy did I want to have? What sort of delivery did I want to have? What are we going to feed our kids? Am I going to breastfeed? Am I going to vaccinate? You know, these are all questions that most parents are facing today, and there's a lot of conflicting, a lot of really emotional conversations that are being had about some of these things. So I want to kind of bring this back into the realm of tangible things that we can do and tangible things that I've discovered in the process of raising these two. And of course they always are this well behaved, right? And they are, they're always this sweet, you know, not exactly. That's more, more accurate of what they're usually like. Um, but they are, they're such a joy and it's, it's been such a, a neat experience for me to see them grow and to um, be my little guinea pigs, you know, as far as what, what strategies you know, we implement, um, but that's, that's them. So, you know, the question, you know, before we kind of jump into optimal kids, um, you know, do we have a problem? You know, do we have a problem with kids being sick today? You know, that's an important question to ask. And, you know, so, so really what, I, what I'd like to talk about now is how sick are kids today? You know, I think we all kind of see our little bubbles, and I think intuitively parents can sense that, yes, there's something off, you know, with this, this generation of kids, but sometimes it helps to take a few steps back and look at the big picture. So as of 2014, one in 68 kids has been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. You know, that's up from, in the 1990s, it was one in 10,000. You know, so, you know so, so autism spectrum disorders are on the rise. Um, one in eight children suffer from an anxiety disorder, diagnosed anxiety disorder. That doesn't count the kids that, that get anxious that maybe haven't been, haven't been diagnosed. Uh, 10 to 15 percent of children and teenagers at any given time are experiencing depression. You know, again, clinical diagnosable depression. Um, 8.3 million children have respiratory allergies. Um, Six million children have diagnosed food allergies. Uh, I think if we, if we looked at food sensitivities, I think that you would see a much bigger, you know, astronomically bigger number with that because I think a lot of kids today have food, food allergies. Uh, 9.5 million have skin allergies. And um, more than 10% of kids have trouble sleeping. You know, so, so this is a pretty big problem. And, you know, unfortunately, when we go to our conventional doctor, the answers that they give us are medication, which is, is needed in some circumstances. But what hopefully we'll be talking about today is all the strategies you can employ before getting to that point of medication. Because a lot of times it's presented to parents that that's their only option. That's, that's, that's the only thing that they can do. And in fact, if they don't do that, 
they're made to feel like less than an adequate parent because that's the treatment strategy. And so I'm here to tell you that there are a lot of other strategies that work and maybe not for every kid and there's definitely not a magic bullet, but there are a lot of other things we can look into. So question, are we over medicating our kids? You know, and again, that's a question I don't think we need to necessarily answer, but I'm just going to give you some facts. You know, 17 million kids worldwide have been prescribed psychiatric medications. 10 million of those are just in the United States. Uh, 3.5 million kids being medicated for ADHD. Um, between 1995 and 1999, this, was, this to me was, was staggering, um, increase in antidepressant use by 580% in the age six and under population. I mean, can you imagine, like being six years old, like what do you have to be depressed about? You know, I mean, it's, it's you wake up, you eat, you poop, and, and play outside. You know, there's, what, what is there to be depressed about? And that to me is just such an indicator that that's a symptom. You know, that's not who they are. You know, that it's a symptom of something else going on. Um, just to go right along with that, you know, children age five and under, they're the fastest non-adult segment um, being prescribed antidepressants. And if you look at adults today, one in four women are on antidepressants. So these kids' moms are also being medicated. Um, and then as far as antibiotic use, there was a study that was done that suggested 11 million visits throughout the course of the year. Kids were prescribed antibiotics when an antibiotic in fact, was not needed and probably would not help the child. So, you know, over over prescribing antibiotics, I think is is, and especially the broad spectrum antibiotics, you know, is definitely an issue as well. So, those are the facts. You know, this this is kind of where we're at. And, um, you know, so taking those facts, let's take a look at some strategies and, and what what we've outlined as far as what we believe are the strategies that you can employ. You know, things that you can look into before going down the medication route that will help, in fact, generate more you know, an optimal feeling, you know, in kids. So it comes down to an individualized approach. You know, no two children are the same. You could have 10 kids who've been put in the same bucket with ADHD who all have 10 different reasons why they have those hyperactive symptoms. So this is an individualized approach. Every child is different and has to be approached that way. There's no magic bullets. As much as I wish there were, that would make my job a whole lot easier. You know, there are no magic bullets with this. Um, healthy diet is an integral part of optimal kids. Um, proper nutrient levels, you know, so making sure there are adequate nutrient levels. And, you know, we can talk, you know, about why, you know, in, in, in our, you know, research and in our opinion, why nutrient levels are lower. Um, but the, the, the fact remains that we test nutrient levels and a lot of kids are deficient in certain nutrients. Uh, restful sleep, you know, this is a big one in our go, go, go society, you know, making sure kids get, get adequate, good quality sleep. Um, movement. This is, this is a big one, and when I talk about movement, I'm going to be talking about not just, you know, exercise for kids, but what does exercise do for the brain? You know, what does movement do for the brain? Why is that necessary? Um, and then, you know, finally, healthy emotions and healthy discipline. And this is probably the one I'm least qualified to talk about, except for, you know, my experience as a parent. But we'll talk about this a little bit, and I put that in there because it has to be a big piece of this. Whether, you know, it's addressed, you know, with an outside counselor or, you know, through parenting styles, you know, this is a big piece to changes that you're going to see within a few days, like putting a child, you know, on a medication. But these are changes that happen over the course of a couple months, but they're sustainable changes. And these are lifestyle changes that we're making for kids. So not only are you changing their symptoms, but you're putting them on a completely different trajectory for the rest of their lives. So it, th there's not a quick fix with this. All right, healthy diet. So when it comes to healthy diet, this is kind of a, a big topic. And actually, every Tuesday, we do a class called Food is Medicine. And, you know, so if you want more information about this, I encourage you to come to that class because in the time we have now, there's no way I'm going to be able to address everything I would love to address with the diet. But m for most parents, they, you know, ask the question, where do I start with all of this? Where do I start? Because most of us kind of look like this, you know, when it comes to the diet, and especially with our kids, you know, how do you get your kids to eat a healthy diet? And um, I'm going to talk about five strategies that, that you can utilize um, to help develop a healthy eater you know, at any age. Now, what's most important about these five strategies that I'm going to talk about is the order in which you do them. If you go home tonight and you tell your kids, okay, that's it. 
we're, we're only going to be eating broccoli and chicken and rice and you try and radically change their diets they're going to look at you like you're crazy and they're not going to do it. They're not going to want to do it. So, but if you follow this kind of step by step and kind of gradually start to wean certain things out of the diet, then you'll be able to start introducing foods to see sustainable changes. So my number one strategy has to be, and of course I think most of us, you know, are aware of is you've got to cut the sugar out of the diet. And as a parent, if you're not actively trying to keep sugar out of your kid's diet, then they're getting too much of it. Because sugar has been sneaking into our food system, you know, like you wouldn't believe. Because we're taking poor quality foods and we're, we're selling them and to make them taste better, they add a lot of sugar, they add a lot of salt, they add a lot of fats. Because those are the things that, that trigger in our brains, you know, a feeling, you know, of feeling good when we eat those foods. So, if, like I said, if you're not actively looking for sugar in your kid's diet, they're going to be getting too much. And, you know, I, I give the recommendation, you know, at the very bare minimum, they've got to be less than 40 grams of sugar per day. That's the bare minimum, you know, and that's actually the recommendation for an adult that's on a 2,000 calorie diet. You know, kids, it actually should be a lot less than that. And what's, what's interesting is the average child under the age of 12 consumes 49 pounds of sugar per year. And when I first saw that statistic, I was like, there's no way that can be right. That's, that's the body weight of some of these kids. There's no way. But when you look at it, uh, one pound of sugar is 450 grams. You look at a can of soda, there are 50 grams of sugar in one can of soda. So nine, nine sodas and you have a pound of sugar. And so, you know, and then you look at other things, you know, hidden sources you might not think about, like a slice of bread could contain up to 10 grams of sugar. You know, so you give your child a sandwich, there's 20 grams of sugar, you put some jelly on it, you know, there's another 10 grams of sugar. You very quickly can get up to that 50 grams a day, which will put you at 49 pounds of sugar per year very quickly. So, um, you know, so the easiest way, the absolute easiest way to cut the sugar from the diet is to, to move more toward a whole foods diet. You know, where you're shopping the perimeter of the grocery store, you're making a lot of the, the snacks that your kids are eating, you're making them at home, you're making them from scratch so you have control over what goes in them. Um, using, you know, you know, different forms of sugar like honey or maple syrup, um, stevia, xylitol, you know, alternative forms of sweeteners are, are better choices than just using white sugar. And they're definitely better than the alternative that's in a lot of our processed foods, which is high fructose corn syrup. And so I, I, I tell families, if you want a fun Friday night activity, you know, this is what we do for kicks, you know, when you have young kids, you know, go to the grocery store, go in the middle aisles and start looking at all the food labels and see how many foods you can find that don't have high fructose corn syrup or corn sugar in them. And you'll be shocked when you start looking at it that all of the processed foods that we're buying and that we're eating have high amounts of, um, you know, these sugars in them. And so, you know, long term, there are a lot of consequences to eating sugar. You know, obesity is a big one. But high fructose corn syrup is, is probably in the top five food triggers that I find in kids, especially with hyperactivity. And so for a, a lot of these kids, not only is it, you know, a detriment to their health, but it's also, you know, a trigger for a lot of their symptoms. So, so definitely, definitely watch out for the added sugar. So that has to be, has to be number one. Uh, just right behind that is clean eating. So again, this goes along with cutting out the processed foods. Um, beyond the sugar and beyond the high fructose corn syrup, there are a lot of additives and preservatives that are added to the foods these days. And after the lecture on the table back there, there's um, a handout that you can pick up that has a list of the most common food additives, what you'll find them in. I, I you know, encourage you, take that handout, take it with you when you go grocery shopping and really start reading labels. Because these additives and preservatives are also another really big trigger for kids and behavioral issues. I, again, that right behind the high fructose corn syrup, you take kids off of MSG and sodium benzoate and BHA, BHT, red dyes, yellow dyes, blue dyes, all the food dyes. You start taking kids off these, these food additives and you'll see a dramatic change in their behavior and their attention. So, um, you know, and these are, they're chemicals. 
you know, and they're, and they're chemicals that are used because the food industry is a business. And like any business, they're trying to make a profit. And so they're trying to make something taste as good as possible while making it last as long as possible on the shelf. And they're looking at their individual product saying, well, there's just a real small amount of BHA, BHT in this. It's not enough to cause you know, any harm to anybody. But they're not looking at what else is in the diet. They're not looking at the air pollutants we're exposed to, the chemicals, you know, in our fabrics, the chemicals, you know, in our water. You know, they're not, the pesticides, the herbicides that are being used on our foods. So we're getting this bioaccumulation of, of chemicals, you know, in our world, and it's an overload for these kids. And so taking out these food additives and preservatives is a very easy way to eliminate unnecessary chemicals in the diet. Um, easiest way to do this is, you know, shop the perimeter. You know, again, if you're buying whole foods, if you're buying a lot of fruits and vegetables, a lot of nuts and seeds, um, you know, then you're not going to be getting a lot of these, these additives. And so, um, you know, so really, really concentrate on getting these out of the diet as much as possible. The last one on here, I actually would love to do a whole lecture just on this topic because I find it so fascinating. But look at the ingredients list for, some, for the natural and artificial flavorings. If you start looking for it, it's one of the top five ingredients that you'll find in foods these days. And it's kind of this ambiguous, you know, topic of what is, what are these things? And, you know, this is something that's really kind of come about within the past 20 to 30 years where the food industry has gotten really good at mimicking flavors that exist in nature and using them to flavor our food. So they take something like a corn chip and they put seasoning on it and now all of a sudden it tastes like a taco. That's a Dorito. You know, so you start looking, you know, and, and they're adding these natural and artificial flavors in a lot of different foods that we're eating. Now you think about it, in nature, these flavorings that, are, uh, that occur naturally in foods, for instance, like a carrot, you know, what makes a carrot taste like a carrot are the carotenoids. It's all the nutrients in it. And that is what makes it appealing to us. So if you all of a sudden start taking these natural, you know, and artificial flavors, and they start mimicking some of these flavors that exist in nature, you're tricking the brain into thinking that you're getting nutrients that the food it, that it's flavoring doesn't have the nutritional, you know, makeup to back that up. So you might think you're eating a carrot because of the flavoring, but there's no carotenoids, there's no nutrients in that. So therefore, you know, there's, there's, there's one theory out there that that's why we overconsume a lot of the processed foods, is that our body's craving certain nutrients, it's craving certain things, we think we're getting it from the food that we're eating, but in reality, we're, we're eating food that's flavored in that way, but there's no nutritional value to back that up. So this is a really, really big step in getting your kids to eat real foods. Because as long as they're eating foods that are artificially flavored, then a carrot's never going to taste good, and broccoli's never going to taste good, and an apple's never going to be sweet enough. You know, if you drink a can of soda, and then you try and eat an apple, there's no way that apple's ever going to compare to the sweetness of the soda. You know, so as long as we're kind of overwhelming our taste buds and, you know, you know, tricking the brain into thinking we're getting things that we're not, then kids aren't going to crave the foods that they need. But if you slowly start eliminating these things from the diet and you start replacing them with real foods, you're going to find all of a sudden that real food actually tastes good to kids. And, you know, and, and we'll, we'll talk about here in just a second how you can even jazz up, you know, some vegetables to make them taste better. But this has to be, this has to be the first step in it because, Nature can't compete with these artificial flavorings. Actually, and there was, there was a really fascinating study that was done back in the 1920s. There was a pediatrician that looked at 15 infants. Her name was Dr. Clara Davis, and she looked at 15 infants, and she, this was before they had ever been introduced to solid food. And she had them, um, when they first introduced food, she would, would give them a tray of 34 different foods to choose from. And she'd let them pick whatever. They would just be given a variety of different foods. And what they found was that, you know, the first couple weeks that the kids were introduced to the foods, they'd try a little bit here and they'd try a little bit there. But over time, kids started gravitating towards certain foods. And they, in each of them, it was a little bit different, but they tend to kind of gravitate towards certain things that they would eat at each meal. And what was fascinating is they found that the foods that they gravitated towards were the foods 
that they were nutrient deficient in. So the best example of this was a little boy with rickets, which is a vitamin D deficiency. He would, each meal, they had a little cup of cod liver oil. Completely unprompted, he would drink a cup of cod liver oil at each meal, because cod liver oil is high in vitamin D. And he would, I mean, what kid drinks cod liver oil completely unprompted? Um, you know, he would drink it, and then once his deficiency resolved, he never touched it again. You know, so there's an intuitive nature toward kids, and if you're listening to that, and if you're really listening to them, they'll give you clues, you know, about what's going on, you know, with them and what they're craving. So the, the, the second thing to that is continuously introduce new foods to kids, especially if you're taking all of this, the, the artificial stuff out, you know, continuously introduce new foods because you might find that they'll try something, you know, when, you know, a few weeks ago they wouldn't. Yeah, so a great example, this is my son. So, you know, we've got a family history, a genetic thing where we're all zinc deficient. And it's, you know, thanks to, you know, you know, family, family history. My dad was, I was. And so I was real attuned to it with my kids. And, um, you know, so before, you know, we, you know, when Brody was, I was introducing solid foods to him, um, I would give him peas. And I found that he would, like, fist palm peas. He would literally eat, like, you know, spoonfuls of peas just you know that'd be the first thing on his plate he'd always go toward and I was just like ah I'm raising a super eater this is great and then I started to notice little white spots start to appear on his fingernails which is a sign of zinc deficiency and peas are one of the highest vegetables in zinc and so I was like hmm this is interesting so I started giving him some supplemental zinc and sure enough he stopped eating the peas. I, he'll still eat them, but I have to prompt him and I have to remind him. He doesn't go for them like he did before because that nutrient, you know, deficiency has started to be resolved within him. So I just, that's what, kids are very intuitive. Listen to them. If they tell you, I don't want to eat something, um, you know, listen to that because I, I think that that, that speaks, to, speaks to them in their, their you know, innate intelligence. Well, yeah, that's a, and that's a great point. And for this is where testing nutrients is so important because in our family, I know that there's, there's a genetic reason why we tend to run low in zinc. And so, so, yes, the ideal way would be to be able to fix that with the diet. But for genetic reasons, we just have a higher need than the average person for zinc. And so, you know, so we could continue to give him peas and that could, you know, correct, you know, that deficiency over time, but, you know, we chose to, to supplement it. But yeah, you absolutely could use food as medicine. So this, you know, very, very um, nicely leads into the next one to that give the foods, kids the foods that they are really craving. And, you know, this is where, again, listening to your kids and listening to what it is they're craving gives you clues about what they might be deficient in. You know, so, you know, if your child's craving, for instance, bacon, or they're craving high-fat foods, you know, then, you know, they're, they're, in their diet, you know, they're able to satisfy that need and that desire for fat with the foods that you present to them. But most likely, that's representing some sort of a need for essential fatty acids in their diet and getting the right types of fats in their diet. So I'm a huge proponent of, you know, giving kids a lot of really good, high-quality, plant-based fats. So I have some listed here, you know, avocados, nuts and seeds. You know, if there's no allergy, nuts and seeds are an excellent option. Cook with coconut oil. You you know, don't cook with the vegetable oil. Um, olive oil is a great one. You know, for my kids, I, especially when they were younger, I would drizzle olive oil on top of all of their vegetables. And um, they loved it. They, they would eat their vegetables, you know, because we are biologically programmed to want fat. So let's give them the good fats. Let's satisfy that need in a healthy way. Um, Grass-fed meat, fish, you know, so, you know, all of those are a great way to give kids the good fat that they need for brain development. 
Um, sea salt is the next one. You know, I'm also a big proponent of let your kids with good quality, healthy, you know, pink Himalayan sea salt, let them salt their foods. Because, you know, in, in sea salt, there's, there's a, a high amount of good quality minerals in them. And so if, if kids are, are craving those minerals or they're craving salty foods, you know, rather than giving them Doritos or rather than giving them Cheetos, let them get it in a healthy way and let them salt their foods. And so my kids, they could love to do that. And they put it on their vegetables and between that and the good fats, they have no problem eating most vegetables. Um, make sure you're introducing a lot of probiotic rich foods. You know, kids these days, the gut flora is so important. You know, especially kids who are born via C-section. You know, we're approaching between 30 and 40 percent rate of C-section in this country, depending on what part of the country you're in. And, you know, when, when babies are coming out of the birth canal, that's their first exposure to, the, to the, the flora, the bacterial flora of this world. You know, when they're inside, they've got a completely sterile gut environment. So their first experience coming out of the birth canal is, is extremely important for populating their digestive system with good bacteria. So babies who are C-section, don't get that exposure and they've tested the flora of those babies and they tend to be high in the flora that are on the nurse's hands or that are in the hospital room and so you're you're pre-populating you know kids with the wrong flora so but one way to you know help compensate for that is just make sure they're getting a probiotic rich diet you know throughout childhood you know whether that's a probiotic supplement you know making sure they're getting yogurt um, coconut kefir water is a great, um, great probiotic. Um, you know, there's a lot of different options, but making sure they're getting the good bacteria in their food is extremely important. Um, colorful foods, you know, make sure that your kids are eating their colors, you know, a wide variety of fruits and vegetables with lots of color. You know, we're very intuitive by nature and we're drawn to color in food. You know, that's why M&Ms are colorful, you know, is because they know that we're drawn to that color. You know, so the, the colorful foods have a greater antioxidant power and they're going to have more nutritional value. So introducing a wide variety of antioxidant rich foods that have a lot of color is extremely important for kids. You know, one of the best ways to do that, and I think Erin might have a handout on this in the back, um, is to make smoothies for kids. Um, you know, so, or you might have, I think you might actually have it at your seat. Um, but make colorful smoothies for your kids. And if your kids won't drink a smoothie, make the smoothie and freeze it in a popsicle mold. You know, I mean, anything tastes better as a popsicle, you know, and that's a great way to sneak in some spinach, sneak in some nuts and seeds, sneak in a lot of whole foods, a lot of colorful foods, um, you know, that, you know, are so important for kids in their development. All right, number four, give your child water to drink with each meal. And I even mean this starting from a very early age. You know, if, if, if I talk to parents about, you know, their child at the age of one, you know, substituting cow's milk for water, it's blasphemy. They're like, well, how are they going to get their calcium? Well, if, if you look, um, there are quite a few, you know, calcium-rich foods that are just as high in calcium as cow's milk and that also have a lot of antioxidants in them. So, you know, for as much as possible, if you can encourage your kids with each meal to just drink water. Just drink water, maybe some herbal teas, you know, something to give a little bit of sweetness. You know, we make a lemonade with fresh squeezed lemon and fizzy water and a little bit of stevia. And my kids love that. Um, and so, you know, so finding alternatives that, that aren't juice or soda that have high amounts of sugar in them. Um, sports drinks, sports drinks are just as bad, just as high in sugar. And they've also got all the food dyes in them as well. Um, but even cow's milk. You know, cow's milk today is not what it was, you know, 30, 40 years ago. You know, cow's milk today, you know, is laden with um, antibiotics. About 80% of antibiotics in, this, in our country are given to our livestock. So a lot of antibiotics, a lot of steroids. You know, cows today pr produce twice as much milk as cows back in the 1970s because they're pumped full of a lot of these steroids to increase production. So, um, and then after that, the cow's milk is then pasteurized, homogenized, so it's high heated, and um, that'll kill all the bacteria, but it also kills a lot of the enzymes that would help your digestive tract break down 
that those milk proteins. So, so milk is it tends, you know, on, on a list of common food allergens, you know, cow's milk is very high for a lot of kids, especially if you've got a child with skin issues, with eczema, with GI issues, ear infections, chronic ear infections, you know, especially when a child, you know, starts ear infections at the age of one when they're put on cow's milk. That's always a big red flag to me that there's, you know, a sensitivity with cow's milk. And so there are a lot of other great options, the best being water that you can replace, you know, that, that milk with. And, um, you know, it's just going to be a lot healthier for your child. And you're going to cut out a lot of the sugar and a lot of the most common food sensitivities that we see. Okay, so last one is maintain a healthy digestive system in children. Um, and this, again, could be a whole nother, whole nother lecture just in and of itself, but it goes back to the idea that kids are intuitive eaters. If your child doesn't want to eat proteins, if they'll only eat carbohydrates, you have to ask the question, can they digest those proteins? You know, if your child will only eat a very limited amount of foods, do they have the enzymes, do they have the bacteria to break down those foods? And so, again, you, you have to assume that they're intuitive in the way that they eat. And if they're eating a very particular way, a very strict way, then you have to start, you know, assuming that there's something going on within the digestive tract. Um, you know, a big one is identifying food sensitivities. We see these very commonly with kids, and these are different than food allergies because food allergies are, you know, tend to be, you know, your anaphylactic, hives, throat closing sort of allergies. They're usually pretty prominent. These are more hidden, delayed sensitivities to foods. So the only way to really be able to identify these is to do a blood test or to completely remove them from the diet for at least a period of one to two months and then reintroduce them. And so that's you know, you know, two of the best ways to identify some of these, these food sensitivities. And I'm gonna keep scooting because we're, we're actually getting close to time. Um, proper nutrient levels, you know, so moving on with our list of optimal kids. Proper nutrient levels is so extremely important. And I've given you a list here of some of the external indicators. You know, if you've noticed any of these, you know, symptoms in your child, chances are pretty good that they have a nutrient deficiency. And it might be that they have that deficiency because they're not getting enough of the foods that they should that contain that nutrient or they're not able to digest those foods very well and extract those nutrients or they are like us there's a genetic reason why they just have a higher need for certain nutrients but there are quite a few nutrients that go hand in hand with some of these symptoms and if your child has any of these the chances are pretty good that there's a nutrient deficiency that is going along with some of these symptoms so what nutrient is the most important nutrient for kids? Does anybody know? This is our famous trick question. <laughs> we ask this at almost every lecture, and we like to trick anybody, all the newbies who've never been out here before. Vitamin C, that's, that's top of my list. But it, the, the answer is it's the one that they are deficient in. You know? So some kids it's vitamin C, some kids it's vitamin D, others it's B vitamins, still others it's zinc. You know? So, so the, the only way we know that is to be able to test for it. And thankfully, technology has improved so much within the past few years that we can now do a lot of this testing via the urine with kids. So that you don't even have to have a stick, you know, a, a, a venipuncture done. So, um, so we can test for, for a lot of these these deficiencies, but these are this is the list that I gave you. These are the most common ones we see in children, and these are these are some of the the ones that you know. For instance, I'll give you the example for my kids. You know, my kids every day you know, take vitamin C. Every day they do a fish oil. They do vitamin D and probiotics. You know, because these are some of the ones that is kind of for the world that we live in. You know, are some of the key ones that we find that kids are deficient in and you know they tend to have the hardest time just with the the stress of all the detox that they have to do the stress of all the different um, you know antibiotic things that they're exposed to you know these are the things that that we find are some of the most important some of the most common deficiencies in kids all right restful sleep so restful sleep is so important for kids and I bring this one up because of you know our lovely invention of electronics that we have, you know almost every kid these days has a tablet or an iPhone or you know a TV in their room, and um, light 
interferes with the production of melatonin in the brain. And melatonin is the hormone that kind of signals your brain to fall asleep. So if your child's watching TV before bed or playing on their tablet before bed, they're not going to be, you know, producing enough of that melatonin hormone and they're going to have a hard time falling asleep or they're going to have a hard time having a restful sleep. So I recommend, you know, turn all electronics off. If you can, turn most lights off about 30 minutes before bed and that's going to naturally stimulate melatonin production in our children. You know, and this makes sense, you know, when you look at our ancestors, they didn't have all the lights that we have today. So when it started to get dark outside, it was very intuitive for their brains to signal that it's time to go to sleep. So um, uh, for, for kids who have a hard time sleeping, which, which, you know, hard time sleeping often goes hand in hand with some of these behavioral issues. And in fact, you can even kind of start to see this very early on in infants. You know, the infants that won't take naps or the infants that have really poor sleep habits very early on, very often are the kids that continue to have poor sleep habits as they get older and they tend to end up with some of the behavioral issues. And I've actually seen kids that the reason they have ADHD is because they're just tired. They're not sleeping well. You know, the, the one child did a sleep study and found out he was his, his he had a, a, a not sleep apnea but something similar and his airway was closing and he was waking up all night. As soon as they fixed that, took out his tonsils, hyperactivity went away. So, you know, that's why I say there's a lot of different root causes and kids sometimes when they're tired, the way they display that is they get more hyperactive. So um, magnesium has great calming effects. So magnesium before bed for kids is a great way to kind of calm them down. Um, you know, making sure that there's a consistent bedtime, a consistent nightly routine is also important, you know, to kind of keep kids on track and on schedule and, you know, getting them to bed at the same time will also help with improving you know, their sleep patterns. Movement. Okay, so this one uh, is, is near and dear to my heart as a chiropractor. And, you know, my, my training as a chiropractor is actually in pediatrics and pregnancy. And I, I, a lot of my training in pediatrics is in the realm of functional neurology. And when you start to look at how kids' brains develop, movement is so critical to their brain development because you know most of the brain development up until the age of two in children is centered around you know you know helping them develop their movement patterns you know they learn to contract muscles to sit up they learn to contract muscles to crawl they learn movement patterns of walking you know it's no coincidence that as soon as kids get comfortable and steady with walking all of a sudden language appears and they start talking because the brain starts developing, you know, when they're born they've kind of got, you know, primitive brainstem connections. As they're learning movements, they start connecting into some of the subcortical areas, you know, into the basal ganglia, you know, into the, you know, um, cerebellum. And, you know, these are all centered around coordination of movements. But as soon as those connections are made, that's when kids start connecting into the neocortex, you know, and that's where learning starts to occur. So there's a, there's, there is a very definitive order that this happens, and milestones in children are extremely important. You know, you want to make sure they're hitting all milestones and hitting them in the right order and, and, and spending an appropriate amount of time with each milestone because that's an indication of brain development. So, um, so with movement, you know, the way our brains develop, our brains are kind of like a self-powered battery. You know, the brain is the battery that powers our movement and our brain tells our body how to move but it's all the movement of the body that then in turn powers the brain back. You know, it's like this, this, this really beautiful feedback loop. So with kids, if there's a lack of movement, there's a lack of time outside running around, a lack of time playing, a lack of time, you know, exploring new things at the park, you know, new ways of movement, that can have an impact on brain development. And if you don't believe me, you know, look at a child who is on the autism spectrum, who does have learning disabilities, and what you'll find is these kids very often have poor posture, they have a weak core, they tend to, you know, have forward head posture, they tend to have clumsy movements, you know, those are the kids that the parents are like, yeah, they just never really got into sports. It's because they don't have a good grasp on their movement. And so, um, so movement is so key, you know, for brain development. Also, movement is, is key with obesity, and I've given a few statistics here with obesity. You know, again, this could be a whole other lecture in and of itself, um, but obesity in children has doubled 
in the past 30 years tripled in adolescents. Um, you know, in 2010, more than one-third of children in adolescents were overweight or obese. Um, and this third one, to me, is really concerning. You know, when they, they studied 5- to 17-year-olds who were overweight, 70% of them had at least one risk factor for cardiovascular disease. You know, I mean, these are young kids. Talk about entering our healthcare system very young. And we test a lot of disease markers in young kids, and very often we see high C-reactive protein, which is a cardiovascular marker. We see, you know, it, and it's also, you know, a, a marker for inflammation. We see, you know, high homocysteine. You know, so we see some of these, these markers in kids, and it's, it's very concerning. But the hope with this is, is these are all dietary based. So this all goes back to what we're feeding our kids and the amount of movement that they're getting. And so, you know, so a lot of this stuff, you know, in, in majority of kids is very preventable if you take on the right lifestyle habits. All right, healthy emotions and healthy discipline. Like I said, uh, you know, I'm sure there are people that could speak to this a lot more, you know, you know, expertly than, than I can. But a few things that, that I have learned and that I do know is that, you know, kids crave routine. They, can, they crave consistency, they crave boundaries. If one parent is telling them you can't eat sugar, but the other parent is taking them out for ice cream, there's a disconnect. And that, that, you know, that's very hard for kids to, to understand that. And so there has to be consistencies and there has to be boundaries within that. Um, you know, I encourage you know, people to talk to your kids. You know, and really listen, you know, because, you know, like I said, they're very intuitive and very often they'll give you all the information you need about what's going on with them if you're just kind of attuned to listen to it. Um, you can't encourage your kids enough, you know, you know, encourage them, you know, kids, you know, working with kids, especially with dietary restrictions, a lot of parents think that, that you know, kids are the worst and they're the hardest as far as dietary restrictions. And I've actually found that my, my kids who are patients are some of my best patients because as soon as they you know, can make the connection between how certain foods make them feel, they are on board 100% and they will stay away from certain foods. And so, you know, so encourage them in that and, you know, you know, help them, you know, kind of explore that. And then the last one is let kids be kids. You know, sometimes I feel like we're kind of in a hurry to make kids grow up these days. You know, there is a certain nature in kids that they are hyper and they are high energy, you know, and that doesn't always mean that there's a problem. You know, I, I, I also have seen a lot of kids that have come in that I'm telling the parents that I don't think your kid has ADHD. You know, there are some root causes we can deal with, but, you know, kids are by nature, you know, a bit on the active side. And so kind of letting them be that, kind of grow into that, you know, sometimes is, is, is the best thing for them. So to end this section, I want to leave you with, with two quotes, you know, from people who are much wiser than I am, um, you know, talking about, you know, talking to your kids and listening to your kids. I love this quote. She says, listen earnestly to anything your children want to tell you, no matter what. If you don't listen eagerly to the little stuff when they are little, they won't tell you the big stuff when they are big, because to them, it has always been big stuff, which is so true. In their little worlds, it's, it, everything is a big deal. And then last one, um, you know, I, and I, I really like this as far as like letting kids be individuals. You know, everybody is a genius. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. So kids don't always fit the mold. Kids are going to have certain strengths and they're going to have certain weaknesses. Doesn't always mean that there's something wrong with them. So that's all I have. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take questions. Um, and... Thank you guys for coming. Yeah. Yeah, so the question, the question was that um, it seems like in recent years that gluten intolerance has been a big topic of conversation. And, um, and it, why did I not mention that in the lecture? And I would, you know, absolutely 100% agree. I think um, it, that's part of a bigger conversation, you know, regarding food sensitivities. And I think what we're still trying to tease out with that is the why. You know, is it really truly the wheat? Or is it something in what we're doing to the wheat? You know, a lot of wheat today is a type of wheat called Roundup Ready 
wheat. They use Roundup Ready seeds where the, the ag industry has developed seeds that grow a plant that's resistant to the herbicide Roundup. And so they can spray this herbicide all over the plants and it won't do anything to the wheat, but it will kill the weeds. So is it the amount of herbicides that we're using? Um, you know, with wheat, we've genetically altered wheat to where, you know, wheat today, you know, is, it's, it's much more, the, the, the stalk is much more straight and much more firm because it holds a heavier head of wheat. And therefore, the starch content in that wheat is much greater. To where on the glycemic index now, wheat falls higher than sugar. You know, so I, not, not that everybody, you know, fits into a mold or, you know, and again, everybody's an individual, but I would say the majority of my patients, I ask them to go gluten-free because that makes such a big difference for a lot of them. And so, and, and for some kids, it is the actual sensitivity to the wheat. Um, for some, they're sensitive to the yeast in breads. Um, you know, again, others, they're sensitive to the high fructose corn syrup that's put in a lot of breads and processed foods. And so, um, but I, I personally don't think it's necessarily something just with the wheat, because I've had patients who can't handle wheat here in the United States that do just fine with it over in Europe. So it, it has to do something with, I think, the processing of, of the wheat, but it is a, a, a big trigger for a lot of people. Absolutely. That's a great question. Yeah. First foods, yeah, for yeah. First foods. And then the other part would be like as far as probiotics. Yeah. Like what? Because um, I know you're talking about the dairy and the processing and stuff like that. Mm. If 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 we're trying to avoid processed dairy, like yogurt and cheese and stuff like that, mm -hmm. what would you recommend? Yeah. Good probiotics, yeah, yeah. So this is a great question. So the first question was, um, what what first foods would you introduce to an infant? Because um, most pediatricians recommend rice cereal as kind of a first food. And the, the first part of that, I encourage parents um, not to introduce rice cereal um, in infants who don't have teeth. Because if kids don't have teeth, they have not started producing the digestive enzyme in their saliva to break down carbohydrates. So when I see a lot of people, especially kind of in my generation where our parents, sorry dad, our parents, you know, started rice cereal when we were four months old, you know, the sooner the better, get them sleeping through the night faster, fill them up, you know, and I see a lot of rice sensitivity, which may be connected, may not be, but rice has historically been very, you know, hypoallergenic for a long time, but I see a lot of food sensitivities to that. So so, um, so I actually, a little story, I actually have um, a patient that I'm seeing that is 12 months old and she has not gotten teeth yet. This, this speaks to the intuitive nature of kids. Um, so she doesn't have any teeth yet. She's being breastfed, is in very healthy weight class, you know, a little, little bit on the chunky side. She's so cute. Um, but pediatrician has prescribed to the mom for her to get occupational therapy and physical therapy because he's concerned that she's not eating foods. And so she'll eat foods, like she'll eat cheese, she can swallow cheese, you know, but she just doesn't want anything else. You know, they'll put it on her tray and she just doesn't want it. And so, I mean, intuitively, she doesn't have teeth. So, of course, she's not going to be wanting to eat foods. She doesn't have the enzymes to help start breaking that down in the mouth. So, intuitively, she's avoiding it. So, um, so as far as food, first foods, you know, I, I actually encourage um, something called baby led weaning in parents because it's... Um, presenting options to kids. You know, of course, I guess we should back up and say number one is breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is absolutely one of the best things, and, and if you are, continue that as long as you can. And as long as you're breastfeeding, there is absolutely no reason to introduce cow's milk at all when they turn one, one. And, um, but um, introduce, when they have teeth, introduce you know, foods kind of in a solid, solid state. You know, so starting with foods that are real soft, like avocados, you know, bananas, you know, start with foods that they can grab. But as long as possible, you know, when you have control over what's put on their tray when they're young, I would say avoid any processed foods as long as possible. You know, so stay away from anything that comes in a box, you know, avoid the temptation to give them, you know, all of the goldfish crackers and, you know, all of the processed foods, um, you know, all the, the quote, baby, baby foods, and just stick with real foods. 
And some babies, and, and baby food, making your own baby food isn't, you know, isn't a bad thing at all either. And I encourage you, if you do baby food, to, to make it yourself. But what I like about the baby led weaning is they're in charge of what they're putting in their mouth. And so they will intuitively kind of go for what it is that they, they need. So. No, no, and so, and that's where, you know, and, and, it, and it, it, every child's a little bit different when you would introduce that. You know, some kids, you know, are fine with that at seven, eight months old. Some kids, maybe it's closer to a year, but as long as you're breastfeeding and as long as they are, um, you know, still, you know, gaining weight and they're healthy, then there's, there's no other reason to, to have to introduce, you know, solids and food, you know, at that early of an age. So, and then is to answer your questions with the probiotics, if you're breastfeeding, best way to do it is for mom to get probiotics. And so, you know, make sure mom has a healthy gut, healthy, healthy probiotics. Um, you know, we have a probiotic that's an infant probiotic that's easy to add, you know, to, you know, water, you know, or, you know, breast milk that you pump and give it to the baby. Or some moms will even just have them sprinkle it on their nipple before they breastfeed and the child gets it that way. Um, but if there isn't an active concern, what you're what you're producing in your milk is probably all that they need, and I wouldn't start supplementing with that early. So, yeah. Kind of along those same lines, I have a two-year-old that still doesn't eat very well. She's learning to eat. So mm -hmm. What do you think in terms of like the intuitive nature of if she likes certain foods or is drawn to certain foods or not? Mm -hmm. At what point should I? Care? I mean, I'm not worried nutritionally that she's giving up. Right. Or if maybe it's a sign of something else. Um. When you say picky eater, what would how what does she like to eat? Um, mostly like crunchy, salty, um, the little bit of like carbohydrate stuff that you give her. She doesn't really eat any meat. Won't eat any meat. Yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of beans. A lot of, a lot of beans. beans. Yeah, I would say. I mean, by the age of two, because the question was, you know, she has a two-year-old that um, that is still not, you know, eating a variety of foods. She's still breastfed. Um, I would say by two, that's when I would start thinking probiotics, and I would, I would start, you know, at that age, you know, introducing probiotics. We actually went through this with my daughter around the exact same time, and she was very similar. She'd eat sweet potatoes, black beans, and yogurt. That was about all she would eat. That's about all she would eat, and she would we eat them well, but um, when we started introducing probiotics for her, um, then all of a sudden her palate opened up and she started trying, you know, more foods. So she, it, it could be, you know, a gut flora issue. And is with there her. a brand you recommend? Um, the brand I recommend is one called Claire. Um, and we have it upstairs, and the reason I recommend that is it's hypoallergenic because, you know, a lot of the strains of bacteria are lactobacillus, so they're made from milk. And so if there is a milk sensitivity, you don't want to be giving a probiotic that's triggering that sensitivity. So those are completely hypoallergenic, and they're made in the dosing for infants so and children. So, yeah. Well, with kids, the first question I asked with yogurt, so the question was about yogurt. You know, is it still beneficial if you're getting it at the grocery store? And um, what, what makes the stuff at the grocery store not as beneficial is the fact that they put a lot of sugar in it. And so if you're getting just the plain yogurt and maybe adding stevia to it or some honey or berries to sweeten it, then yeah, you're still getting a probiotic effect from it. They still have good probiotics in them. Um, but... Because of the taste of yogurt, I mean, that's a big one for hidden sugar. You know, if you look at some of the pouches, you know, you could have 20, 25 grams of sugar in one serving for children. So, so you have to be careful because the sugar will negate some of the good effects of the probiotics because it feeds yeast and it feeds candida in the gut. So, but yeah, if you're getting plain yogurt, I would, of course, highly recommend organic. Um, but if you're getting organic plain yogurt and sweetening it yourself, then yeah, they're getting a lot of great benefits from that. So, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, that's, I, the question was about the rice arsenic, you know, combination. And so, yeah, I mean, I honestly, you know, probably am not as well versed to be able to speak it on, into that in any detail. I mean, there has evidence, you know, evidence has come out that there are traces of arsenic um, in rice. Um, I don't know the quantities of it to know, you know, how serious you know that is um, you know 
like I said, rice is always, you know, a little bit of a red flag for me because so many people are sensitive to it. And so for other reasons, you know, I recommend, you know, kind of keeping an eye out for rice. But, um, but I honestly, I can't speak to how serious, you know, that, that issue is. So, right. Yeah. There are reports that have come out and especially I think it's the rice from China. That's, that's the worst. And so buy United States rice. <laughs> Any other questions I can answer? All right. Well, thank you guys.